Have you ever stopped to think about what a day in the life of the world's wealthiest and most notorious drug lord was like? From his early years of crime up until the man he turned out to be, you could pretty much say that Pablo lived an exciting life. As a result, you would expect nothing short of an equally interesting daily routine. And you might be right to do so. In today's video, I'll show you what a day in the life of Pablo Escobar looked like across three important stages of his life. I've got to say, some of the stuff that I uncovered during my research on the drug lord are quite interesting, to say the least. Stay tuned to find out just what Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria's daily routine entailed. Pablo's daily routine in the beginning. Pablo Escobar was born on December 1st, 1949 in Rio Negro to his father, Abel Escobar, and his mother, Hermilda Gaviria. Shortly after Pablo was born, however, his parents moved houses to Envigado, a town in Medellin, where the youngster lived out his childhood years. Contrary to the popular notion that Pablo was illiterate, the criminal mastermind had, as a matter of fact, gotten admitted into a university in Medellin. However, he left the university without graduating and decided to turn his focus to criminal activities. Many believe that Pablo's decision to turn to crime was based mainly on his desire for a better life. And that makes sense, because although he died as a rich man, Pablo had very humble beginnings. Growing up, his father had worked on a farm while his mother was a teacher in an elementary school. Taking his background into consideration, it should not come as a surprise that Pablo started carrying out criminal activities while he was only a teenager. His early crimes included stealing gravestones and selling them to smugglers in the area. Along with Oscar Benel Aguirre, Pablo's friend, Pablo became an expert in crime as he began to discover the ins and outs of a lot of criminal activities. A little later down the line, they both got into fraud and began selling counterfeit cigarettes, lottery tickets, school diplomas, and even stole cars. Seeing how Pablo had not earned his spot in the public eye just yet, not much is known about his day-to-day -day activities at this point. However, seeing how his early criminal act centered around gravestones and car theft, it is safe to assume that he worked under the cover of darkness and spent the greater part of his day strategizing. Before Pablo joined the world of the drug trade, he also got orders from big organizations to steal items and sometimes worked as a bodyguard. On one occasion, it was reported that he was given the sum of 100,000 Colombian pesos for kidnapping an executive in Medellin and holding him for ransom. At a very young age, Pablo made up his mind that when he reached 22, he ought to have a net worth of over a million Colombian pesos. For this reason, the young lad gave no thought to working for a smuggler of contraband goods, Alvado Prieto. He carried out his operations in Medellin. A few years down the line, when Pablo was 26 years old, he reportedly had about 100 million Colombian pesos in his bank account. So, it is safe to say that he was living the dream. At around this time, Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador were widely known for growing cocoa. And because these countries were in close proximity with Colombia, the drug trade began to grow in Colombia. Pablo took this as a cue to begin his venture into smuggling drugs. Pablo's daily routine as a Medellin cartel leader. In 1975, Escobar started carrying out drug trade operations and established the Medellin cartel, a very popular crime organization at the time. About a year later, Pablo and some of the men who worked with him were arrested because the authorities had found about 18 kilograms of a white substance, drugs which Pablo had been trying to get into Medellin in their possession. Like most drug traffickers would do in this situation, Pablo had tried bribing his way out, but the judges in charge of this case refused to give in. Several months of going back and forth in court had caused a drastic change in Pablo's routine, and he was starting to get agitated. Plus, it probably occurred to him that he might be sent to jail. If that happened, all his time spent working early and attending meetings would be of no use. So to prevent this, he ordered the killing of his arresting officers, which turned out to be more effective as his case was then dropped. Later on, there came a great clamor for cocaine in America, which meant more business for Pablo. To cater to this growing demand, Pablo began to spend most of his time setting up more routes for smuggling drugs, as well as various networks to distribute them in California, South Florida, Puerto Rico, and other countries. It is recorded that around the mid-1980s, Pablo's cartel had dominated the trade of cocaine, which in turn placed much power and wealth at Pablo's disposal. As Pablo reached massive heights in his career and was appointed new responsibilities, it was only expected that his schedule would endure the same. It is said that he used to wake up very early in the morning to address issues that were affecting his business, especially those he suspected would have negative effects on his business, as you would expect of someone who wasn't big on taking chances. Aside from waking up to supervise his business, Pablo created time for his political affiliations, as they were very instrumental to his business success. At some point, Pablo was so invested in politics that he was appointed an official representative of the Colombian government when Felipe González was being sworn in as prime minister in Spain. 
At the peak of his career, Pablo had gained massive popularity. He had also met and married his wife, Maria Victoria Henao, in March 1976, and their relationship was waxing stronger. Maria was 15 when they met, and her family disapproved of their relationship. Refusing to be deterred, the young couple eloped together and started their family. A few years into their union, the lovers gave birth to two children, Juan Pablo, who now goes by Sebastián Marroquín, and Manuela Escobar. To the surprise of many, Pablo, a man feared by all, found a way to factor his family life and his new position into his daily schedule. It was recorded that he was quite good at ensuring that his children were adequately taken care of and sometimes spent the little time he could with them. In addition, Pablo reportedly built a property solely for his children, where they could entertain themselves by playing various games and doing other fun stuff. During the time he wasn't working, Escobar took out time to visit the vacation houses he had, and sometimes he took his children along. Pablo was reportedly worth about $25 billion, and so you could guess that his properties were just as lavish. In Colombia, Pablo had a 7,000-acre property which he named Hacienda Napoles after Naples in Italy. According to reports, the building is worth about $63 million and is not only decorated with dinosaur statues, but lakes as well. It is also said to contain a soccer field, tennis court, man-made lakes, an airstrip, and an arena for bullfighting. There was also a zoo in the property where Pablo housed animals like camels, hippopotamuses, giraffes, and so on. To add to the list of his properties was an island, Isla Grande. To this day, it is said that the island was Pablo's Caribbean getaway. It used to house a mansion, courtyards, a landing pad for helicopters, and a huge swimming pool, amongst other jaw-dropping amenities. In addition to his long list of activities, Pablo also dedicated some of his time and money to sponsoring several projects directed at helping the poor. So much so, that people began comparing him to Robin Hood. However, this side of Pablo began to clash with the kind of man he was while operating his drug trades. Escobar was known to have spent a huge chunk of his time planning the assassination of police officers, government officials, and even ordinary citizens that stood in his way. In 1989, Pablo allegedly blew up a plane, only because he was trying to end the life of a supposed informant. It turned out that about a hundred people lost their lives as a result. Clearly, this was not one of the drug lord's logical ideas. Pablo's daily routine in prison. Due to all of Pablo's heinous crimes and his drug involvement, the police began to search for him so they could bring him into custody. It took a while, but they eventually captured him, after some negotiations, that is. Pablo surrendered to the police in June 1991 and was confined in what became his own luxurious non-public jail, La Catedral, which contained a soccer pitch, a nightclub, waterfall, telephones, fax machines, and a lot more. Aside from restriction of movement, Pablo's imprisonment had no effect whatsoever on him because of the luxurious life he lived, even behind bars. While he was in prison, Pablo's schedule changed dramatically to accommodate his new situation. He began to hold meetings in La Catedral, and he spent a significant amount of time communicating with his daughter on the phone. In July 1992, things got heated when Pablo escaped from jail a couple of days before his transfer to a different prison after allegedly killing four men from his cartel in La Catedral. A year later, in December 1993, his Medellin hideout was discovered by the police. As Escobar attempted to escape, a shootout ensued. In the end, he got shot. Of course, it is important to note that some reports say he killed himself. Which school of thought is right? I guess we may never know. What remains certain, however, is the fact that when Pablo died, the Medellin cartel died with him.